Mayor Frank Jackson and the City of Cleveland are committed to keeping your neighborhood clean and green through the use of the city-issued trash and recycling carts. It's safe, convenient, and mandatory. For more information, contact the Cleveland Division of Waste Collection at 216-664-3717. Good evening. good evening, and how are you doing this evening? Good, good. You know, um, I want to thank you for coming to my 14th State of the City. Uh, this is, um, I think it's the 14th, is it 13th or 14th? Huh? 13th. I'm ahead of myself. Uh, but um, this is a new format in that we wanted to have it so that uh, the public uh, could come uh, for free and that they could come in the evening when they were more likely to not be at work and then parking wouldn't be as bad of a problem. So I, again, I want to welcome you and really thank you for being a part of this this evening. Okay? So we'll get started. Uh, Cleveland is a successful city. But Cleveland is not a great city. A great city is one where everyone can participate in quality of life and prosperity. When we eliminate disparity and we institutionalize equity as a normal function, then we can have a great city. Success has a short self -life, shelf life, but Greatness is sustainable. In order to become great, we have to have the courage and a strategic plan to get there. It also means that we recognize that success should not and is not our goal, but it is what we have to do every day and do it without even thinking about it. Greatness forces us to be disrupted, and it forces us to commit to actions that makes the status quo unacceptable. So as we strive for greatness, we still have to do those basic things right, those little things, those things that may not be glamorous, but without them, there will be no possibility for us to be successful, let alone great. Now let's start with the basics. Now every organization and institution must have sound fiscal management. And Cleveland is no different. The city of Cleveland is a municipal corporation with a $1.7 billion budget. We are not a private or for-profit corporation our bottom line is not profit, it is service. State law requires that we have a balanced budget. And if the cost of running the city is greater than the revenues coming in, then we must either reduce the cost, raise revenue, or do both in order to balance the budget. Cost reduction will always result in a cut in service. And increased revenues will happen through economic growth, job creation, taxes, and fee increases. The city of Cleveland has overcome two major challenges, two major events that has affected our revenues. Now, the first one was the recession, the Great Recession of 2008, which resulted in uh, basically almost the collapse of Wall Street. It resulted in foreclosures, bankruptcies, job losses, and a reduction in property value. The city of Cleveland lost tens of millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars in the form of income taxes, property taxes, and other various fees. But at the same time, the city's cost of delivering service went up 
because of the abandonment of the property and the rising safety issues. All of this resulted in layoffs and service reduction. Now, the second major event was the cut in over $143 million between the years of 2010 and 2016 from the state of Ohio. Unlike the recession, where the driving factor was financial mismanagement in the private sector, this event was a direct attack on city revenues by the state of Ohio and cannot be understated. Our economy was recovering from the recession, corporate profits were up, jobs were being created, revenues were coming into the city of Cleveland, we began to restore city services and bring back laid off employees, but the attack on our local revenue stream forced Cleveland and other Ohio cities into budget deficits that again resulted in service reduction and in layoffs. Again, the city of Cleveland struggled through these challenges, these two major events, and avoided bankruptcy. Our ability to avoid bankruptcy was not by luck, but rather it was the result of sound fiscal management, correct fiscal policy, and decisive decision making. But it became apparent that if we were going to financially survive, be able to meet our bottom line of quality service and position this city for the future, then we needed more revenues to replace what the state had cut. In 2016, the voters of the city of Cleveland passed issue 32, which is an income tax increase. Again, a tax increase that would not have been necessary but for our cut, but for the cut in the state budget and revenues to us. Now, I continue to thank the people of the city of Cleveland for their support and passage of issue 32, and you'll see why. It has made it possible for us to hire additional employees, restore, enhance, and create new services and programs throughout the city of Cleveland. Again, these are basic city services, the little things, the things that you have to do right, that not only allowed us to meet our bottom line of quality service delivery, but put the city in a position to be able to move forward. For example, and I'm going to recite a bunch of uh, things, so be patient. Department of Public Works increased staff uh, in order to allow us to develop new recreation programs, placed armed off-duty police officers in every rec center and outdoor pool, provide a fourth cut on our vacant lots, abate over 1,000 uh, dump sites, enhance our playground and athletic field maintenance, increase the number of trees inspected and trimmed. Issue 32 also allowed us to add funding to our 50-50 sidewalk repair and tree removal program restore the residential street sweeping and leaf pickup. It allowed the Division of Waste Collection to purchase new equipment, add staff, improve the daily collection, and reduce the complaints about collection. The Mayor's Office of Capital uh, uh, Projects and the Department of Public Works invested $24 million in the resurfacing of 275 residential streets in 2017 and 18, and invested $95 million on 36 of our main and secondary streets. And we completed citywide pothole repairs by mid-July. And we repaired over 3,000 sidewalks under our tree damage sidewalk program. Issue 32 has also allowed the Department of Building and Housing to hire staff to assist in debt collection for demolition and board up, create a rental inspection unit, and increase uh, uh, rental registration from over 40,000 in 2016 
to over 50,000 in 2017, and it allowed us to increase our safe route to school demolition budget by 100% going from 5 million to 10 million. We demolished 720 abandoned and vacant structures, and we added $3 million for abandoned commercial structure, bringing the total of demolished properties to around 10,000 since 2006. Department of Public Health hired employees focused on youth violence as a public health issue, continued to focus on preventing lead poisoning and reducing infant mortality, addressed the opiate epidemic, improving our environment, enhanced our HIV AIDS program, as well as other health-related initiatives. In 2017, <clears throat> the Department of Aging served over 5,000 individuals in one or more of our core programs and hired a social worker, <clears throat> a home repair coordinator, a grants administrator, a housing manager, a Spanish liaison, and the Senior Transportation Connection Service provided over 28,000 rides to Cleveland seniors. The Division of ENS, EMS added 72 employees, purchased nine new ambulances, opened up uh, seven new uh, EMS stations, increased the number of ambulances on day and even shift to reduce response time and received the Ohio State Emergency Medical Technician uh, Training Accreditation so that it allows them now to hire, train, and certify candidates to become EMTs with training starting next year. The Division of Fire graduated number uh, total of 39 cadets this past July. They have 20 in a class right now and will put on another class early next year. We opened up fire station 28, engine number two, to provide relief to the downtown and near west side fire companies, as well as support the Celebrees fire boat when necessary. Division of Animal Care and Control will open a new kennel in December this year with new staff that will care for animals, respond to field calls, assist with field operations, and work with the veterinarians. This does not include the over 400 Friends of the Kennels volunteers that help in the care and adoptions at the kennel. And I want to thank them for their help and their support. So you can see doing these little things, and, and this is just running the city every day. It's just running the city every day, but I'm not finished. Unfortunately, <clears throat> Cleveland is not unique when it comes to the challenge that law enforcement faces. We're facing some of the same challenges as most major metropolitan areas, such as the opiate crisis and gun violence. Crime, particularly violent crime, challenges our quality of life, and affects our ability to create a city with a sustainable future. The Cleveland Division of Police is in the midst of an aggressive recruiting program to have 1,600 police officers sometime in 2019 is the goal. Between 2017 and 18, the division held five academies, graduating 193 police officers. We are currently training 87 police cadets in two academies, and we are processing 80 recruits so that we begin another class this December, and we will begin a minimum of two classes in the early uh, spring of next year. Law enforcement partnerships are important as we fight the drug problem and as we fight violent crime. The Division of Police regularly partners with law enforcement agencies at the local, the state, and the federal level. This year, law enforcement has confiscated over 1,200 firearms and seized high volumes of narcotics, including heroin, cocaine, fentanyl, and marijuana. The Gang Impact Unit 
and the repeat and violent offenders uh, enforcement program, working with our partners, have arrested nearly 200 violent fugitives on charges including aggravated murder. In addition, we have established a new homicide review task force to help us as we attempt to solve our open homicide cases. These investments are crucial to fighting crime through enforcement actions and removing criminals whose behaviors reduce the quality of lives in our neighborhood. Community engagement is also important in our fight to reduce crime. This year, the Division of Police introduced the Community Engagement Officer Program. Now this program, uh, it enhances the division's ability to provide community policing and increase trust in our neighborhood. In 2016, the division purchased 300 bikes as part of the RNC, uh, and they are used throughout the city at various events at different times. In 2014, I invited the Department of Justice to the city of Cleveland to conduct a review of the Cleveland Division of Police. We entered into a consent decree, and we're focused on training in several areas. The use of force, crisis intervention, bias-free policing, community and problem-oriented policing, and search and seizure. The consent decree gives us the opportunity to create systematic and holistic reform. Everything that we have done and that we've been successful at, we have done as one community. And that principle applies to law enforcement also, where everyone has a role to play in helping to keep our neighborhoods safe through aggressive urban law enforcement that follows constitutional policing and respects the community, and community engagement where police and citizens work together for safety and quality of life in our neighborhoods. The introduction of new technology is especially important in policing today. It ensures that Cleveland is a city of the future it is a valuable tool as we fight crime. The Division of Police is in the process of implementing a real-time crime center that will assist officers in solving crime almost immediately. In 2014, Cleveland became the first major police department to equip all frontline officers with body cameras. Now this greatly improved and greatly reduced the amount of citizen complaints against police officers, as well as help to reduce the use of force while increasing accountability and confidence by our citizens. In April of this year, I announced my Safe Smart CLE initiative, which is combined, which is a combined LED lights with smart surveillance camera technology. Phase one includes a $34 million investment converting 61,000 streetlights to LED over the next 18 to 24 months and installing approximately 1,000 security cameras citywide. This technology will allow Cleveland Public Power <laughs> this technology will allow Cleveland Public Power, just one of the things it will allow, Cleveland Public Power to use smart photo cells to do proactive mating, so you don't have to call in and get the number of the poll and all that stuff. It, it, it helped, the technology helps. While allowing for our police to have the ability to do smart policing in our neighborhoods, and, and that combined with the real-time crime center will help us to be able to in, uh, address some of the violence that's occurring on our streets. The city of Cleveland is using innovation and that will position all of our departments with technology of the future. Because as I said, we, our bottom line is not profit, it is service. 
So we had to be able to deliver that service effectively and efficiently. And some of the, some of the overall technology enhancements, just some of them, includes our implementation of NeoGov, an automated system of, for recruiting, training, and testing, and hiring of all city employees. We have new computer-aided dispatch system, which allows for calls for service to be viewed in the vehicle instead of waiting on radio dispatch. We completed the overhaul of our record management system and instituted an automatic automated vehicle locator program citywide. We have installed new software that allows for the tracking and repairing of fire hydrants, purchased thermal imaging technology that allows firefighters to locate people in darkness and in smoke. All of what I... All of what I just said are things that we do every day. This is just the basics. This is just the basics. That's all this is. And it is the only a portion of what we are doing. However, in order for all of what we have done to be sustainable, to better guarantee the city's future and better position the city for the future and for greatness, we are increasing our investment in people. One such investment is in youth and young adults. To address crime, particularly violent crime, we cannot depend on law enforcement alone. We cannot do that. A broader, holistic approach has to be used. Crime, dysfunctional behavior, poor choices, a negative community environment are all symptoms of underlying problems. Last January, I created the Mayor's Office of Prevention, Intervention, and Opportunity for Youth and Young Adults. Because the city understands and we recognize that violence, particularly youth violence, is a public health issue. This office utilizes public health approach as it develops programs and initiatives to assist youth and young adults as they develop the knowledge and skills necessary to be successful in school, the workplace, at home, and in the community. Many of our youth and many of our young adults suffer from trauma and are in a toxic stress environment that they live in which occurs at a very early age and is continually reinforced. It shapes their minds, it shapes their emotions, their decision-making, and it has a severe impact on that individual, that family, and the community. The Office of Prevention, Intervention, and Opportunity has created several initiatives to identify direct to proper service, and begin the process for recovery. The Toxic Stress Trauma Management Initiative has trauma-trained coaches at all of our rec centers. The coaches and all of our rec staff have been trained to identify youth and young adults exhibiting signs of trauma or toxic stress. And then they connect those youth and young adults and their families to the appropriate resources, treatment, and supportive services. As part of this program, we are developing year-round programming and activities at all of our rec centers in an effort to reduce the harmful effects of toxic stress and to provide our young people and their families with the tools and resources they need to live productive, quality lives and to make better choices and decisions. An important part of this program is our partnership with organizations 
and agencies that have expertise in this area. We have and continue to create juvenile reentry and diversion programs designed to connect high risk and formerly incarcerated youth with wraparound supportive services to reduce the likelihood of recidivism and to create a foundation for a successful future. We're providing quality summer and year round employment and internship and exposure to opportunities to assist our young people in developing career readiness skills that prepare, prepares them for the future. Now, I want to remind you, because a lot of times people stereotype. And, and, and of course, we, 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 since we have the problem of crime and violent crime with young people and stuff, we're focused there, not only in terms of law enforcement, but also in trying to remedy that. But I want to remind everybody, I want to remind you that many of our young people are making the right choices and decisions in spite of the challenges that they face. And this initiative is just designed to assist them also. A toxic stress environment and the behavior and decisions that come out of that environment is a major contributor to crime, poor choices, and is an impediment to educational achievement. Education is the key to our success. And the elimination of educational disparity is essential if we're going to be a great city. Now, what are some of the things that we're doing to eliminate uh, disparity in education? One effort, just one, there are many, but I'm just identifying one here, is a pre for cleave. Children that start their education in high quality preschool are more likely to do better and be prepared to enter kindergarten. Pre for Cleve, along with the county's investment in children program and other community agencies, are working together to better prepare our kids to enter kindergarten. We also have the Cleveland Reform Plan of 2012, which helps move the Cleveland School District in the right direction. Since the institution of the Cleveland Plan, graduation rates have gone to 74.6%, which is a 22% increase, I believe, from the year 2011 or 12. African American and Hispanic students' graduation rates at 75.2 and 74.3 percent, respectfully. 83.8 percent of our third graders met the third grade reading guarantee, which is a growth of 4.3 percent. Math and English test scores have improved by an average of 6.7% over the last year. 43 of 104 schools received a C for closing the achievement gap. 13 high schools saw improvements in the four year graduation rate with nine of them achieving rates over 90%. The Cleveland School of Architect and Design, along with Cleveland Early College High School, both have a 100% graduation rate. Now these are just some of the accomplishments and they indicate that the district is making improvement and the district has been successful in some areas, but as a system, as a system, we are failing and not closing disparity fast enough. A tool that the school district is seeking to use to achieve the highest academic gain in the shortest period of time is Say Yes for Education. <laughs> Say Yes to Education recognizes the effects of a trauma 
imposed individual of a toxic stress environment and on a child and the child's willingness and ability to learn. Say Yes to Education works for the local community to develop an infrastructure to identify the needs of the child and finds proper wraparound services for the child and the family in addition to retooling the system, the social service system, and helping and working with the community as the community raises money for scholarships. Now Cleveland, if accepted, if accepted, Cleveland will join Syracuse, New York, Buffalo, New York, Guilford County, North Carolina, uh, when it becomes the fourth community-wide city to become a Say Yes city. Each, now each of the current Say Yes cities have shown improvement in academic outcome for children. Say Yes to Education is a valuable tool to assist the school district in moving forward faster, but more, more has to be done. If we're going to see improvements in the shortest period of time, then we have to do things that are more innovative in our methods of teaching based on how young people learn and where the world is going. You know, a few months ago, I had an opportunity to visit the construction site of a new medical school, which is a partnership between Case Western Reserve University and the Cleveland Clinic. I saw blueprints of their medical library. Uh, and not only was it small in terms of space, I was told that they had very few books. So my question was, first of all, how do you have in a medical school a small library? And then secondly, how is it that you have very few books? And then the answer I got, I received was by utilizing virtual reality. Through this technologies, students is able to have virtual hands-on experience with changing scenarios. If we are going to position our educational system for where the world is going, then we have to break out of the confines of existing models. The problem-based learning approach uses virtual reality technology to achieve this. The approach works by giving the student a task and a problem to solve instead of giving them a lecture, a reading assignment and out of a textbook or some traditional method or material. They are not uh, memorizing things or digesting long texts of information, but rather they are figuring out what the issues are and then how do they solve for those issues. An example of this approach is at work in the Learner College of Medicine. No tests, no lectures, no grades are given. Neither are there class rankings of students. Problem-based learning and virtual reality creates images where students are heavily involved in two and three dimensional anatomies, which makes it real, it makes it visual. It is linked to the problem the student is trying to work through and solve. The student easily grasps it and they better retain that which they learn. The same model and method can be used outside of medical school. It can be used to teach mathematics, engineering, or a whole spectrum of, of, of subjects. Now we do have to create a model to demonstrate that it works with students regardless of their previous academic achievement. Also that it works for children who've been exposed to a toxic environment and who have suffered from traumatic experiences. There are no panaceas, ladies and gentlemen, but this innovative approach and technology, along with Say Yes for Education, will go a long way to eliminate disparity in education in the shortest time and position our educational system for the future.
Now, positioning Cleveland for the future through innovation and breaking out of traditional models, and the other, uh, I'm diverting a little bit, so I'm off script. Uh, you know, we have these models that kind of keep us confined. And whenever we, um, whenever we um, uh, call ourselves being innovative, and whatever we talk about, we're doing reform. If we do it within the model, all we're doing is incremental improvement, which means you're going to get incremental results, which means that it won't last and it's not sustainable because you haven't changed the real problem. So that's what I'm talking about. So with this technology and breaking out of traditional models also applies to economic development. You got to break out of it. You just can't tweak the thing sometimes. So under my administration, the Department of Economic Development invested over $400 million in approximately 1,000 development projects. That leveraged almost $3.6 billion of investments in our business district and in our neighborhoods. These investments led to the creation of over 22,000 jobs and the retention of over 13,000 jobs. We have invested in vacant and contaminated properties. We're cleaning them up and returning them to the market under our industrial commercial land bank program. Over 138 acres of properties have been repurposed for public facilities and private development sites. Our small business and neighborhood development program has supported over 490 small and medium-sized businesses, from retail to manufacturing to technology, and collectively under this program is the employment of over uh, 12,000 people. The, economic, the Cleveland economic economy continues to recover. We continue re to recover from the recession of 2008 resulting in new challenges that we face and also the need to adapt to this changing world. Our Cleveland airport system is key to our future and its ability to adapt to the changing environment has helped us sustain Cleveland's economy. This year alone, Cleveland airport system increased its passengers by over 15%. They were They were also awarded the most improved airport by region in North America. Standard & Poor's upgraded their rating to A, and Moody's increased the rating to A3, which is the first time in eight years that both rating agencies have rated our airport system in the A category. It's doing the basic right. Manufacturing remains the largest sector of our economy. However, while manufacturing production continues to grow, manufacturing employment remains flat. The healthcare sector is the largest growth sector. The Health Tech Quarter Initiative has new health and technology development like University Hospital, Rainbow Centers for Women and Children, and Link 59. We have Dealer Tires, Cleveland Heart Lab, again, uh, the, the clinic and the university with the dental and medical school, along with Tri-C's Metro Campus renovation and the things that are going on at Cleveland State University. All are examples of investments that are occurring. Metro Health is also investing $1 billion in its new campus on West 25th Street. Now that, now that would be a catalyst, that would be a catalyst for growth on the near west side, again, another major investment. The information technology sector is growing and is where we are struggling to fill the jobs that are, that are in demand. Now, um, this is a new thing for me, but uh, uh, I'm trying to understand it, blockchain. Now, blockchain is a new disruptive technology, that's what they say, that's how they say it, they say it, which has the potential to create jobs of the future. 
This December, the city of Cleveland will be one of the sponsors of the Block Land Solution Conference, where developers, business leaders, government representatives, blockchain experts will all meet and connect on how real world application of this technology, how does it really work? The question is, after I've gone through all of this economic development side, that is basically what we do on an everyday basis. The question is, has all of this economic activity that I just mentioned resulted in prosperity and quality of life for everyone? Community benefits is just one of the ways to connect growth and prosperity with local companies and citizens in terms of contracts and jobs. Since the signing of the Community Benefits MOU in 2013, the total construction spend on public sector, this is just public sector, contracts, the city of Cleveland, was $446 million. 197 construction projects were developed, 319 of subcontractors and suppliers participated. MBEs and FBEs received over $110 million in contracts and wages to Cleveland residents working on Cleveland public sector construction totaled over $38 million. So in this respect, this very limited respect, because I know this sounds like a lot of money, but this is a very limited uh, 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 respect. The Community Benefits Agreement has helped ensure greater participation in construction projects in the public sector. However, it is not enough to guarantee that everyone can participate in prosperity and quality of life. The public sector alone cannot ensure that. The private sector has to be part of it. Now, going beyond construction and going into supply diversity, whether in the public or private sector, is the next step if we're going to move into the future for our ability to have a broader wealth creation in, in the city of Cleveland and in this region. Just like crime, just like crime, is a symptom of a greater ill. The lack of equity and a lack of prosperity in our economic system is also part of a systemic disparity that has to be resolved if we're going to be a great city. If we want to be a great city, which will be the cities of the future, then there has to be economic growth and wealth creation that is inclusive of everyone in all Cleveland neighborhoods. Now, some of this, let me mention just one of the steps that we're taking. Now, two years ago, I announced my Neighborhood Transformation Initiative, which is a systematic approach focus on providing sustainable and equitable opportunities to build wealth and to stabilize our neighborhoods. We have leveraged $25 million in bond funds and $40 million from the banks, the nonprofits, and philanthropic community, and we're really focused in four areas. Commercial redevelopment, residential development, entrepreneurship slash wealth creation, and workforce training. Now, in my last two states of the city, I gave examples of how the investments of public dollars really leverages a significant amount of private investment. But I also said that under traditional development models, that just simply doesn't work in some neighborhoods. We are implementing new models that will leverage public investments to ensure equitable private investments throughout the city. To make these new models work, the private sector 
has to take risk where it would not have taken it under the old model. The Neighborhood Transformation Initiative includes mixed-use uh, development and um, re um, how do you say we're reactivating commercial corridors using uh, a 44 million dollar Cleveland Impact Fund to provide access to capital for development. In addition, a new retail incubator will provide rent and tenant build-out subsidy. Now, seniors will have access to homeowner repair programs to assist with health and safety repairs as part of our age-friendly Cleveland effort and assist them in aging in place and ensure they would not be displaced because, you know, as development occurs, gentrification soon follows, so you have to be intentional about not doing that. A new down payment assistance. A new down payment assistance program and a forgivable loan program. Were, both of these were created for landlords and tenants to make repairs, but also to prevent displacement. Now, the Glenville Circle North project is currently under construction at the corner of 105 and Ashbury. They will be, in addition to that, there will be 26 uh, new construction single-family homes that will be built. 15 vacant homes will be rehabbed and resold for market rate. A local developer will develop 20 market rate homes between 118th and 122nd between Ashbury and Wade Park. Now the Now, this wouldn't occur under the old model. The market is responding to the city's investment in a way it wouldn't have to have done under the old model. Again, this is all designed to create wealth, equity, and opportunity for all Clevelanders. This is transformative action taken by the public, private, and philanthropic sector where traditional models are not working in distressed areas. Now, the $331 million Opportunity Quarter Project is another chance to transform neighborhoods. The Opportunity Quarter Project connects I-490 at East 55th to 105 in Quincy. It goes through the upper part of the healthcare quarter, connecting up University Circle. Opportunity Quarter traverses some of the most distressed areas of this city, but investment and development opportunities do exist here. Over 190 acres of underutilized properties can be assembled, clear, and remediated for economic growth, jobs, and wealth creation. Innovative tools and models are necessary, however, to connect people with job opportunities and businesses with the demand for goods and services from those institutions in that area. The Opportunity Corridor Project will be measured by how it helps to reduce disparity in jobs, create wealth, and quality of life. Now, we just completed uh, in this very space our Sustainable Cleveland Summit 2018, which focused on the year of vibrant neighborhoods. And in order to have a sustainable, vibrant neighborhood, we have to do all the things I just spoke of. And we have to consider the environment in which people live. During 2018, I joined 400 climate mayors across this country to reaffirm Cleveland's commitment to climate action and to continue our goal of reducing Cleveland's carbon pollution footprint by 80% by 2050. <laughs> next year, next year will be the culmination 
of Sustainable Cleveland 2019, and it will focus on people. And the question will be, the question will be, like it always should be, this way it should be, out of all of what we do, the question should be, are people better off economically and socially as a result of all of what I talked about, all of what we've done? All of what we've done as a city, as a region, as a community. Everything that we are doing, everything that I am working on, that drives the decisions and the policies, is to ensure that we provide a better outcome for the people. In that, we have seen some success, but as if you read the theme of this uh, state of city, what got us here won't get us there. Success, while necessary, should not be our goal. We should not be content with success. We cannot talk about we did this or we did that and these little things and we've been successful and we believe that we can go home and say our job is done. We cannot and should not accept success as our goal. Success is not sufficient for us to become a great city. Now that being said, Cleveland is well positioned for the future and has the chance, not the guarantee, ladies and gentlemen, but it has the chance to become a great city. Now we have the ability to do this. The question is, the question always is, however, do we have the will? The will to have the courage to transform our economic and social models in a way that guarantees that all share in quality of life and prosperity. And the will, the will to break out of traditional models that have institutionalized disparities and inequities as an acceptable outcome. Do we have that will? That is our challenge. It can be done. It must be done. And I believe that it will be done. Why? Because we are Cleveland. Thank you very much.